Welcome to Cambridge Forum. Tonight we're, we have Matthew Bunn of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government who will be talking on rogue states and suitcase bombs coping with the new nuclear threat. My name is David Rush. I'm a physician, member of Physicians for Social Responsibility and the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. The nuclear threat did not disappear when the Cold War ended. Instead, it fractured and morphed into new 21st century forms which have kept the nuclear clock set close to midnight. From disposing of old nuclear weapons to building new uranium enrichment facilities, from the protocols of deterrence through mutually assured destruction to the image of the suitcase bomb, Matthew Bunn examines the various sources of nuclear threat today and explores means of containing and controlling them. Which nation states pose the greatest nuclear danger? What role do non-state actors play in the current landscape of nuclear threats? How are national and international governing bodies addressing these new nuclear threats? What role can concerned citizens play in preventing nuclear catastrophe today? Matthew Bunn is Associate Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and Co-Principal Investigator for the Project on Managing the Atom at the Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. His interests include nuclear theft and terrorism, nuclear proliferation and measures to control it, and the future of nuclear energy and its fuel cycle. His recent research has focused on Iran's nuclear capacity. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Matthew Bunn. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's uh, toward the tail end of a long and dismal winter. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for being willing to come out. Um, my title is rather alarming, and in fact, uh, I think somebody else added the, the rogue states and suitcase bombs thing at the front. Uh, uh, I, uh, among other things, I'm going to be trying to offer you a little bit of good news as well as surveying some of the threats uh, that we face. And uh, one of the pieces of good news is that there are almost certainly not suitcase nukes on the loose. Um, uh, this, there were nuclear weapons designed to be carried by individual human beings. Uh, but uh, I'm now reasonably confident that all of them, both in the United States and Russia, are accounted for and that almost all of them have been destroyed. Um, the more important piece of good news uh, is really about the spread of the nuclear threat uh, in general. There is a global effort to stem the spread of nuclear weapons. Uh, which does face, I have to admit, enormous challenges, uh, which I'll talk about uh, tonight. But many people think that we're in a situation where any dictator who wants a nuclear bomb can get hold of one, and that's just not the case. Uh, there are today nine states that have nuclear weapons out of almost 200 countries in the world. 25 years ago, there were nine states that had nuclear weapons. Now, North Korea added itself to the list, but South Africa became the first country ever to subtract itself from the list, to uh, dismantle a nuclear stockpile that it had built itself and, and had fully under its control. So we had no net increase over a quarter century. Uh, and if you think about it, that quarter century included all of the chaos that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union. It included secret nuclear weapons programs in Iraq, Iran, Libya, Syria, North Korea, um, uh, that we know of. Uh, <clears throat> it included uh, the entire export period of the global black market network led by uh, Pakistan's AQ Khan, which I'll talk about in a moment. The fact that we managed to get through that with no net increase is an amazing public policy success story. Now, of course, as any investment advisor will tell you, past performance is no guarantee of future success. Um, but I think it does give us a feeling that this regime has been much more successful than people realize. And if we don't recognize that success, as frankly the Bush administration largely failed to do, 
we will sort of assume that all of these measures are worthless and don't really do anything, and therefore we won't take the steps to strengthen them that will make us all uh, safer. So the first measure, first message is, is that things are, things are not as grim as you might think. In fact, there are today more states that started nuclear weapons programs and decided to give them up than there are states that have nuclear weapons. That means that our efforts to convince states not to go to the bomb succeed more often than they fail, even for those few countries that start down the path. Most countries are just not interested in nuclear weapons and don't uh, start down the path. <laughs> it has never been true in human history before that the most powerful weapon at our, available to our species was so widely forsworn. Today, all but four countries in the world are parties to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which for all but five of its parties says you're not allowed to get nuclear weapons. And most of those countries are parties in good faith uh, to that treaty. Nonetheless, we face some big challenges uh, to this effort today. What are some of the biggest challenges? Uh, first of all, North Korea. North Korea became, a few years ago, the first country ever to pull out of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and then go ahead and test a nuclear bomb. And they tested again uh, right after President Obama took office. They now have revealed that in addition to their plutonium-based nuclear weapons program, they now are per have in place the other path to the bomb as well, a uranium path with an uh, enrichment facility uh, that's up and operating that we didn't know existed until a few months ago um, and that uh, appears actually to be probably somewhat more sophisticated, uh, at least from what little we know about it, uh, than the Iranian uh, effort. And there's, I think, a real danger of exports by North Korea, which is a very desperate and poor country and has already exported what appears to have been a plutonium production reactor to Syria, which Israel bombed uh, in 2007. Iran is another uh, major challenge uh, to the regime. Here we have a country that is, appears to be walking right up to the edge of a nuclear weapons capability while staying at least formally within the nuclear non-proliferation regime. They're in clear violation of multiple Security Council resolutions demanding that they suspend their enrichment and reprocessing activities. So resolutions they consider illegitimate and therefore that they don't have to comply with. They also violated their safeguards agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, for many years. And they are certainly uh, provoking a lot of concerns uh, among their neighbors, not only Israel, but also the Gulf states. There was some quite candid remarks from some of the Gulf state leaders that were revealed in the WikiLeaks uh, cables over the last uh, few months, including the uh, Saudi king. Um, but there is at least a little bit of good news on the Iran front as well. Their behavior so far does not seem to suggest that they're going straight to the bomb as fast as they can. Uh, there is a debate among US analysts as to what it is the Iranians are after. Uh, it's my view that um, there are multiple factions in Iran and that they have not yet reached a decision that they actually want to go straight to nuclear weapons, that there are factions that do want to do that, and there are other factions that think that the international sanctions and opprobrium associated with that would be more than they're worth and that they get most of what they want by having the option to do that at some point in the future uh, rather than deciding to implement that option uh, right now. I actually have a bet with a colleague in the government department at Harvard, which is now uh, a year and a half into a 10-year bet. I bet him that from within 10 years, starting a year and a half ago, Iran would neither test a nuclear weapon nor pull out of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We'll see whether I win my bet uh, or not. Um, a third major challenge is terrorists, uh, who uh, somewhat to the surprise of many of us really have been pursuing nuclear weapons. Um, the Japanese terror cult that launched the Amshin Rikyo, that launched the nerve gas attack in the Tokyo subway in 1995, also pursued nuclear weapons at some length. They sent people to Russia looking to see if they could buy uh, a bomb. Fortunately, they were crazy enough that they had a very confused way of going about it. Among other things, they tried to get a meeting with the Minister of Atomic Energy to offer him a check for a million dollars in return for a nuclear weapon. That particular minister probably was corrupt, but he wasn't that corrupt. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> he, he was entertaining. He had, uh, they hadn't, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they didn't really have the idea of conflict of interest uh, fully developed at that point. They still don't really in Russia. But he had this great, these great business cards that said, Viktor Mikhailov, Minister of Atomic Energy on the front, and you flip it over and it was Minister of uh, uh, Viktor Mikhailov, President Chetek Corporation. Chetek Corporation was a company that marketed nuclear explosive services. So if you had some <laughs> chemical waste or whatever, they would come to your country and dig a deep hole and destroy it with uh, nuclear weapons. Fortunately, he never got any buyers uh, for that particular survey. Uh, Al-Qaeda more recently has been uh, pursuing nuclear weapons and we're pursuing it fairly aggressively in the years immediately uh, before 9-11 and uh, the program actually got as far as carrying out some initial crude tests of conventional explosives for use in their uh, hoped for nuclear bomb in the desert in Afghanistan. Uh, I believe that that's a real and urgent challenge, but I'm not one of those who believes, you know, it's inevitable terrorists are going to make a nuclear bomb. Harold Agnew, the former director of Los Alamos, had, a, I think, a good summary quote. He said, those who think it's easy for terrorists to make a nuclear bomb are very wrong, but those who think it's impossible are even more wrong. So it's not easy. It's not something that is a trivial thing for terrorists to be able to do, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. A fourth major challenge is black market nuclear networks. Uh, Pakistan's AQ Khan led a black market technology network that was marketing sort of the technologies of choice for the determined nuclear cheater, uh, uranium enrichment centrifuges and also actual bomb designs to uh, Libya, to North Korea, to Iran. Uh, they offered them to Iraq. It appears that they uh, also uh, offered them to Syria. Um, this, was op this network was operating in some 20 countries for uh, more than two decades before it was finally brought down, which means all of our systems to prevent that kind of thing fundamentally failed. Export controls, law enforcement, intelligence. By the end, it was intelligence that succeeded in bringing them down primarily, but it's, it's not a pretty story. Uh, and then you have, uh, as another fundamental challenge, the, the reluctance of the states that have nuclear weapons to move away from reliance on these uh, terrifying weapons of destruction. Um, there are still tens of thousands of nuclear weapons in the world uh, today, um, at least that physically exist. There are still many thousands that are in operational stockpiles. Um, and that's just crazy, and we need to be uh, changing that. So what do we do to reduce these risks? It seems to me that the recent crises for the regime over the last 15 years or so teach us a number of pretty clear lessons. Uh, first of all, we've got to secure the nuclear weapons and nuclear materials. The, the good thing on the nuclear terrorism front is it's w completely implausible that terrorists would ever be able to make their own nuclear bomb material, their own highly enriched uranium or their own plutonium. So if you could lock down all the nuclear weapons and all the highly enriched uranium and all the plutonium in the world, you could prevent nuclear terrorism. The further good news is that we've gone a long way in that direction. There were, I can tell you some entertaining stories of just how bad the security was in especially the former Soviet Union when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. They had designed their security system for a closed society with closed borders and pampered, well-cared-for workers and everybody under close surveillance by the KGB and all of that had, had gone away. And they really did have gaping holes and fences and all that kind of thing. But a, a lot of that is fixed now. The security in the former Soviet Union is like night and day compared to what it was back then. And that's what I've spent a lot of the last 20 years of my life working on. Um, and we've made a lot of progress in a number of other countries. There are uh, uh, more than a dozen countries now that uh, used to have potential nuclear bomb material on their soil, and there's just none there anymore. It's all been airlifted out. Uh, and we're con that's continuing at a fairly uh, rapid pace. We're hoping to get all of the potential bomb material out of Ukraine uh, by the spring of next year. Uh, with luck, we might also get Belarus by the uh, spring of next year. One of the really good pieces of news is that Libya not only gave up its nuclear weapons program, uh, back in 2003, and so we don't have to worry about a nuclear bomb in Gaddafi's hands with everything that's going on right now. But what's more, there used to be quite a chunk of highly enriched uranium in a town called Tajura. That's one of the ones where the unrest is now taking place, and all of that has been airlifted out. There is no potential bomb material 
uh, in Libya anymore. So the first lesson is we've got to secure these nuclear stockpiles as fast as we can. That's what President Obama's uh, nuclear security summit uh, was about last spring. I was particularly pleased by the nuclear security summit because the main thing that all the leaders assembled agreed to was that we should try to secure all the nuclear material around the world within four years. And that particular thought came from my pen originally. So that was sort of an interesting experience to have all these leaders saying, let's do Matt Bunn's idea. Uh, second, we have to do more to stop the black market nuclear technology networks. And this is going to involve international cooperation. You can't do it just by you know, military force invading countries or whatever. It has to be done through cooperation, as does the securing of the nuclear stockpiles. Um, and it has to involve intelligence cooperation, law enforcement cooperation, uh, stronger export controls, better enforcement, real penalties when uh, people violate these kinds of things. Most of the key uh, operators in the AQCon network, these people who are selling the world's most dangerous technologies, are free men today. Most of them have never forfeited any of the money they made. Um, you know, they're living in their villas in France, um, et cetera. <clears throat> Third, we need to uh, strengthen the safeguard system of the International Atomic Energy Agency. These are the international inspections that make sure nuclear material isn't being diverted. Uh, and it's pretty clear that uh, they need a lot of strengthening. Uh, they have, since Iran's enrichment effort was revealed by an opposition group in 2002, I think they've done a very professional job of peeling away layer after layer of Iranian lies. But the reality is Iran had an illegal uranium enrichment program covertly for 18 years before that without the IAEA noticing. Um, and so that makes it pretty clear that there's, there's work to be done uh, to uh, strengthen IAEA safeguards. Um, and it's about giving the agency more resources. The entire budget for global inspections of nuclear material all over the world is approximately the same as the budget of the Indianapolis Police Department. Um, it involves giving them more authority uh, to go more places, have access to more information, and so on, uh, better technology, uh, and backing them up with, with action in the Security Council uh, when necessary. Uh, we need to, in a world where nuclear power is becoming at least somewhat uh, more attractive to a broader set of countries and is likely to spread to more countries, we need to limit the spread, of, particularly of the technologies associated with nuclear power that are most related to nuclear weapons. And that is the technology to enrich uranium, so you can take it from the natural uranium that you dig up out of the ground that can't be used in a nuclear bomb to highly enriched uranium, which can be used in a nuclear bomb. That's a very difficult and sensitive technology. We want to limit the number of countries that invest in building their own enrichment facilities and therefore have the capability, should they ever choose to do so, to use those to make nuclear bomb material. And similarly, plutonium reprocessing, which takes the spent fuel from nuclear power plants and separates out the sort of 1% of it that is plutonium that's, that's usable in weapons. That can be recycled as fuel, but it could also be used for weapons. And so that's also a very sensitive technology. It can be used for civilian purposes, but also can be used for military purposes. And there's a lot of e interesting efforts underway to give countries uh, better assurance that they will always be able to get their fuel from the international market, for example, by setting up a fuel bank under the International Atomic Energy Agency should they ever face a cutoff so that they won't have as much incentive to invest in their own enrichment facility to provide their own uh, fuel. And there's more that we could do on the reprocessing end as well. Fifth, we need to toughen enforcement. Um, in a number of cases, countries have violated the rules and basically suffered no consequences as a result. And that can uh, increase the incentives for other countries uh, to um, uh, follow suit. Uh, six, we need to really engage with the hard cases. And there is actually a tension here between enforcement and engagement. Because take the case right now of North Korea. So North Korea is behaving horribly, in my view. You know, they have sunk a South Korean vessel. They've shelled a South Korean island. They've revealed this big enrichment plant that they had been denying before that is a clear violation of the agreed framework and the various other agreements that they had signed. Um, uh, and so there's a real temptation to just focus on sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. But if we want to get them to agree to any of the things that we want, 
that would serve our interests if they were to do them, to say, cap their nuclear program at least, um, prevent spread of their nuclear program to other countries and so on, it's very likely we're gonna have to offer them something that makes it seem to them that it's in their interest to agree to those things. And so there's often a tension between want to, wanting to offer countries something in order to get good behavior, uh, but at the same time wanting to punish past bad behavior, and also not wanting to pay for the same horse again and again and again, because we've given North Korea incentives to agree to these various other past agreements which they agreed to and then violated, and then do you really want to pay again to get them to sign up to a similar agreement again, and so on. So it's actually a very difficult choice now what exactly the best policy is, either in the North Korean case or in the Iranian case. But I would observe, looking at the history in both of those cases, that those times when we were focusing on sanctions and isolation, their programs went ahead. Uh, in those times when we were engaging, we did actually manage to make some progress in slowing things down, putting a cap on things, and so on. Just take, for example, the agreement that was reached with North Korea in the mid-90s, what's called the Agreed Framework. Under that deal, the North Koreans agreed to freeze their plutonium production, which at that time was the only route to the bomb they had. Um, and uh, the spent fuel that had the plutonium in it was under international inspection. And in return, the United States and its various allies were going to provide heavy fuel oil uh, and um, build, ultimately, a, an actual civil power plant uh, in two civil power plants in uh, North Korea. Well, that froze plutonium production in North Korea for eight years. And then the Bush administration got uh, evidence that they were pursuing this uranium enrichment path and confronted them with it. And um, they, uh, and then the question was, well, why should we be continuing to pay for the heavy fuel oil if they're violating the agreement? And so they cut off the fuel oil shipments and the North Koreans uh, pulled out of the non-proliferation treaty, took all, kicked out all the inspectors, reprocessed all the plutonium in that spent fuel, made it into nuclear bombs, tested a nuclear bomb. Now they have a bunch of nuclear bombs and we don't know where they are. Before, the, you know, if anything went wrong, we could have struck you know, the Yongbyon facility with a military strike and that would have been it because that was, that was where all the plutonium was as far as we knew. Um, now that's not, now we don't know what the heck to strike even if we wanted to implement a military option because they've presumably moved the plutonium and the nuclear weapons someplace else. Uh, so, you know, we saw what the result of engagement was. We got a cap that lasted for eight years. It was violated, you know, it wasn't that great, but it was a lot better than pulling out of the non-proliferation treaty, kicking out the inspectors and testing nuclear weapons. Uh, and you can tell a similar story about Iran. So I think actually engaging with the hard cases and as difficult as it is in our own domestic political system, you know, offering them things that convince them that uh, it's in their national interest to agree to some kind of compromise is needed. Seventh, we've got to reduce demand um, for nuclear weapons. Um, ultimately, if states are really determined, they get nuclear weapons, if they remain really determined for a really long time. But as I mentioned, there are more states that started and decided to give up than there are states that have nuclear weapons. So our efforts to reduce demand actually are, are more successful than we think. So it's things like building alliances to make sure states are confident that they'll be secure even without nuclear weapons, resolving regional conflicts for the same reason. I think if we manage to get a Middle East peace deal, that would be important in terms of the nuclear incentives of countries in the Middle East, and so on. So there's a lot we can do to reduce demand. And, but also on reducing demand, there's our own behavior. If we and the other nuclear weapon states send the message that nuclear weapons are absolutely essential to our security and they do all, all sorts of great things for us going well beyond just deterring nuclear attack on our country uh, and we need lots of them and we need lots of different kinds and, and you know we need them to be on constant alert that will greatly strengthen the arguments of pro-nuclear hardliners in other countries who say you know nuclear uh, weapons might be good for us too. My colleague John Holdren who's now uh, President Obama's science advisor used to say, boy, if the United States with its conventional forces needs nuclear weapons to deter chemical or biological attack and not just nuclear attack, then there are 180 countries in the world that have a better argument as to why they need nuclear weapons. It's a little bit of an overstatement, but uh, uh, I do think our, our behavior is not the key driver of nuclear proliferation, but it is an, an additional argument 
for the pro-nuclear hardliners. And that leads me to the final lesson, which is keeping our end of the bargain. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty represents a series of bargains, but one of the most important ones is that the states without nuclear weapons agreed not to get nuclear weapons, and the states that had nuclear weapons agreed to negotiate in good faith toward nuclear disarmament. And the non-nuclear weapon states really feel we haven't kept up our end of the bargain. There are, in the US arsenal today, almost as many nuclear weapons, at least in strategic deployed nuclear weapons, as there were when the Non-Proliferation Treaty was signed. There are a lot fewer than there were 20 years ago because we went way up after the, nuclear, after the Non-Proliferation Treaty was signed and then back down again. But um, there's a lot more to do on, on nuclear arms reductions. But there's good news there in the sense that uh, President Obama laid out a very visionary approach in uh, April of last year, uh, two years ago in Prague, um, laying out a vision of a world free of nuclear weapons someday, maybe not in his lifetime, he said, but that uh, as a direction. Uh, and he has made real progress with the uh, New START uh, treaty that was just ratified by the Senate. But the difficulty of getting that treaty, which was thought to be such a you know, modest, small step, let's just make sure the inspections get going again and cut things a little, that's basically what that treaty was about, it proved to be very difficult to negotiate with the Russians and then very difficult to get ratified by the Senate. It was touch and go. We almost didn't have the votes uh, in the Senate. Um, I led a delegation to, with a, a number of retired Republican national security officials to go talk to Scott Brown about that. Um, and he did, by the way, ultimately vote in the right direction on that. Uh, but just how difficult that was makes clear to me just how hard it's going to be to do really transformative change in our nuclear weapons. To me, the most depressing part of that treaty is that the number is 1550. That means that there are still people in both governments who think that 50 weapons, one way or the other, makes any difference at all, which means we still really don't understand the meaning of the nuclear age in a, in a deep way, uh, in my view. So what can you do? Um, what can the average citizen do about all this kind of thing? First of all, get informed. There's, there's a number of uh, non-government organizations and so on that have uh, you know, email listservs where you can get an email twice a week or something like that that gives you the main news stories about what's going on. There are places uh, where you can you know, read uh, fairly um, simple and, and easy to understand material about what's happening. Uh, secondly, uh, get involved. Um, you know, write a letter to your local paper, write to your congressman, um, write to the State Department and say you want action uh, on these things. Get involved with some of the non-government organizations that are involved in this kind of thing. If, you're, if you are interested in the notion of a, a the vision of a world free of nuclear weapons, get involved with the Global Zero Campaign or with the International Physicians for Prevention of, of Nuclear War. There's a lot of uh, organizations working on these kinds of things. Right here in Cambridge, there's the headquarters of the Union of Concerned Scientists, for those of you who are a little more technically minded. And third, contribute. There are almost all of those of us working on the nuclear threat need money to keep going. And uh, there's a lot of good organizations that you can sort of filter your, your contributions through. One I would mention in particular is a, something called the Plowshares Fund, which f does a pretty good job, I think, funding both sort of grassroots activism but also expert uh, work and, and the combination of the two. Um, and one of the nice things about them is uh, they have a, a small endowment, just enough to pay their own operations so that every dollar that you give to them actually goes to program rather than paying for their own operations because they can pay for that themselves. Um, so I'm going to stop there. and I've gone on too long already, I'm sure, and I will open it up for questions. You are joining us at, Ca at Cambridge Forum, listening to Matthew Bunn discussing rogue states and suitcase bombs coping with a new nuclear threat. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then throw it open to the audience. Um, just today, we heard in the news that a minister in the Pakistani government was murdered for thinking wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, Pakistan is a nuclear s power it has a fragile government. It is, it seems to me, the one nuclear state which is engaged in an ongoing conflict with another nuclear power. I w wish you would say something about the threat 
in South Asia, and then I'll follow up with a different question. Well, I'm, it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it because I skimmed over that without, uh, and it is a, a major source of a wide variety of different kinds of dangers. So here is a country that is uh, armed with nuclear weapons, that is uh, rapidly increasing its nuclear stockpile. It used to have a, a nuclear weapons program based entirely on highly enriched uranium. And a few years ago, they built their first plutonium production reactor. Then they built another plutonium production reactor. And now they have a third one almost done and a fourth one under construction. Uh, and so fairly shortly, uh, it seems likely that Pakistan will become the third largest nuclear power in the world, surpassing both you know, India, Israel, China, uh, and so on. And they are Al-Qaeda's world headquarters, basically. That's where the key Al-Qaeda leadership is in the tribal areas. And they are a country that uh, with huge unrest, huge divisions and conflict, um, uh, not only between Islamic extremists and others, but uh, between ethnic separa separatists and Baluchistan and Sindh and so on. Um, they have this ongoing conflict with India that has come to war multiple times after their Conduct, the two countries conducted nuclear tests in 1998. Um, uh, they uh, went to war almost immediately thereafter in 1999 um, in the Kargil uh, incident. That uh, And Pakistan has a, because it has, rel it fears being taken over by India and has relatively little strategic depth, it has a doctrine of using nuclear weapons first and early and fast and a doctrine of sort of dispersing the nuclear weapons and dispersing the authority to use them quickly so that India wouldn't be able to, you know, take out its, its ability to command its nuclear weapons and prevent it from uh, striking with nuclear weapons. So this is all extremely distressing, especially when combined with two, uh, well, three things I, I would mention, uh, which are, um, relate to sort of insiders' uh, threats within the system. Uh, one is, of course, this AQ Khan network. Khan is now a free man. Uh, again, he remains a national hero in Pakistan. Um, we don't really know how much of that network's activities were authorized by the Pakistani government and how much were sort of rogue operations. And how to even define that? I mean, at what level of senior officials being involved does it become, do you count it as a government operation as opposed to counting it as you know a few rogue elements or whatever. If the chief of staff of the army, which is basically the most powerful person in Pakistan, usually more powerful than the president or prime minister, is involved, does that mean it's a government decision? You know, so it's it's a murky question. I have a colleague who was in my program until recently, uh, who's a Pakistani, who when he was working in the government in Pakistan was the case officer for a corruption case as opposed to an illegal export case against AQ Khan and basically recommended to his boss, the head of this anti-corruption agency, not to pursue the case because while the corruption was rampant and clear and obvious, it penetrated so deeply in the Pakistani establishment that Khan would be able to take the anti-corruption agency down before they could take Khan down. Um, and so that was the decision not to pursue uh, the case. Um, so that's one insider episode that's worrisome. Another is uh, this uh, UTN network that was uh, cooperating with Al-Qaeda on nuclear weapons uh, in the months before 9-11. There were two very senior Pakistani nuclear weapon scientists who actually sat down with bin Laden and Zawahiri, the two top people in Al-Qaeda, for extended discussions of essentially how to make a nuclear bomb. And, uh, the leader of the two, a guy named Sultan Basharuddin Mahmood, uh, who was fired from the Pakistani nuclear program because his views were so extreme, um, was explaining to bin Laden that it, it was very difficult to make the nuclear material uh, for a nuclear bomb. And bin Laden said, what if I already have the material? And one of his colleagues brought out a big canister. And nobody knows what was in that canister, but it's a distressing conversation nonetheless. Um, 
Oddly, the Al Qaeda program doesn't seem to have stopped after they lost the Afghan sanctuary in 2001. In 2003, the um, Al Qaeda Saudi cell was negotiating to buy three objects that they believed were Russian nuclear devices. We don't know to this day what they actually were because it doesn't appear that there were Russian nuclear weapons actually missing at that particular moment. And um, they received instruction from senior Al Qaeda leadership basically to go ahead and make the purchase if the Pakistani specialist confirms that they're real using his equipment. And we have never managed to identify who the Pakistani specialist is that Al Qaeda had such confidence in and whether that person is still, uh, that person is presumably still at large and may well still be working with them. So Pakistan is a, a, a nexus of nuclear weapons, extremism, conflict with a neighbor. Um, and, you know, I think this is unlikely for the time being, but certainly can't be ruled out given the events of the last 10 years or so, potential uh, collapse of the state. Um, so I'm, I'm anyway. glad to hear something somewhat less optimistic than you started with. And my last question is that I've heard one of your colleagues actually say the question was not whether there would ever be a single nuclear explosion, but when. And I wondered how you felt the effect on, on our society would be if such an explosion takes place anywhere really, but obviously worst here in the United States. <clears throat> well, I am more optimistic than saying it's not a matter of whether, but when. Uh, now, of course, if you extrapolate to infinity, if you say, you know, over the next 200,000 years, you know, it, it never is an awfully long time. Uh, but uh, for, the, for those of us who are mathematicians, if you have a, a constant probability every year, no matter how low that probability is, eventually it, the thing is going to happen. But if you have a declining probability every year, it's not clear that it integrates to 100%, even if... Uh, even if uh, you extrapolate to infinity. So um, I, I would argue we can make that probability decline every year and, and uh, hopefully prevent nuclear terrorism from ever occurring. That certainly is what I've been devoting a big chunk of my career to for the last 20 years or so. Uh, but one of the reasons I'm doing that is because I think it would be a very catastrophic event. Uh, there's people who say, oh, well, you know, we lived through Katrina. We more or less lost a city there. Uh, you know, we'd lived through this. I think it's a very different thing. It's a very different thing, partly because either the terrorist who did it or somebody else would call up and say, I've got five more, and they're already hidden in US cities, and I'm going to start setting them off unless you do exactly what I want. And they'll make that threat public. And the potential for fear, panic, chaos, the threat will be very credible after that first mushroom cloud goes up and it's quite possible people will start fleeing major cities. We have very little ability to uh, you know, sustain those people on the countryside. Uh, um, but also within the city itself, you're gonna have tens of thousands of uh, burned people, tens of thousands of just normally injured people from buildings falling on them and so on, tens and thousands of irradiated people. We haven't got you know, a tenth that many burned beds in the entire country. Um, and then there's the question of what happens to our way of thinking about government and about civil liberties and about foreign policy and about the sovereignty of nations. I mean, if you think US foreign policy has been violent and annoying since 9-11, wait till you see what happens after a, uh, the center of a major city goes up in smoke. Um, uh, and when people realize that the nuclear material that was used in that bomb was maybe this big, then think about what happens to notions of search and seizure and what, what, what is an unreasonable search if, you know, if the alternative is maybe another one of these goes off. Um, I, I just think uh, the more I think about the consequences, the more I think, boy, prevention has got to be our focus here. Thank you very much. You are listening to Cambridge Forum as we continue our discussion with Matthew Bunn as he explores the new nuclear threats of the 21st century and new strategies for coping with them. The floor is now open to, for audience questions. Please line up at the microphone, and please, questions, not lectures. So uh, 
do line up, and if, if, if a lecture seems to be occurring, I will ask what the question is. So, Professor Bunn, the first action item you mentioned to create a safer world was to secure the existing nuclear weapons. And I wonder if you would elaborate a little on what securing them means. To me, it's, it conjures up the picture of fastening a bicycle to a, a parking meter, but you must mean something more than that. So what does securing them mean? Uh, indeed I do. So there, there are actually quite elaborate uh, security measures. Uh, just, you know, human beings have been securing valuable items for thousands of years, but of course thieves have been overcoming those security measures for thousands of years as well. But uh, there's a lot of the basic things, you know, fences, intrusion detectors, uh, various kinds of barriers, vaults, armed guards. Uh, good accounting is, uh, I think, very important just to make sure that you know that all the stuff is still on hand. And there are a lot of uh, really, you know, I'm going uh, I'm gonna break the rules about not using uh, visual props uh, just to describe uh, this kind of thing. Um, it's often hard to keep track of all of the stuff that you've got. And, and uh, if there's a small theft, it may go unnoticed. There are, so theft of highly enriched uranium and plutonium is not a, a theoretical <coughs> worry. It's an ongoing reality. There are about 20 pretty well documented cases of seizure of highly enriched uranium or plutonium that had been stolen. And uh, in all but one of those cases, the material had never been noticed to be missing uh, until it was seized. Uh, and so that gives me at least a, a, a feeling that probably there's more out there. Uh, I just wanted to mention this, for those of you listening on the radio, this is a shiny uh, metal object about half the volume of a hockey puck uh, and there's a facility in Russia where there are 80,000 of these made of either highly enriched uranium or uh, weapon-grade highly enriched uranium or weapon-grade plutonium. Um, if they're plutonium, about 100, a little more than 100 of them would be enough for a bomb. You could put a dozen or so in your pocket. Uh, and when we started working with the Russians in the 90s, uh, this facility, um, there, were, there were holes in the fence. There was no detector at the door to set off an alarm if someone were, were carrying out a dozen of them in their pocket. A lot of them were lying out on sort of the workbench and they would leave them lying out on the workbench when they went home uh, at night. Um, and they had no identifying marks and there were a bunch of them that were just made out of aluminum so it would have been quite easy to you know, switch the aluminum ones. This is an aluminum one, by the way. I'm not holding plutonium in my hand. Uh, would have been quite easy uh, to switch one, you know, a bunch of the aluminum ones for the real ones and put, take the real ones away. Well, you know, today all of those desks are sitting in a big vault with a huge thick steel door. Um, they each have a little laser barcode etched onto them. Uh, there are not one but two radiation detectors that you have to pass through in the hallway coming out from the vault uh, that would set off an alarm if you had any, if you, you know, had pocketed at any of those while you were in the vault. There's, you know, of course, a security camera in the vault and so on. Uh, I remember when I visited this particular vault, my uh, guide said, you know, I, I really ought to give you a, uh, we ought to do the briefing before we go into the vault. And I said, well, why is that? I said, he said, it's hot as a pistol in there. And, and when we opened the vault door, he had a little radiation meter, and it just pegged over into the rat the moment the door opened it. Because not only do they have plutonium in there, they have a bunch of neptunium-237 in there, which is hot as a pistol. Anyway, so we didn't spend very long in that room. Um, there was another facility uh, where they have, it's, it's quite amazing actually, uh, from a safety point of view, it just gives me the willies. They have these shelves that are, oh, I don't know, five, six foot across, maybe 100 foot long, seven shelves stacked up to the ceiling in each of two, uh, you know, columns. Um, and there's just pieces of uranium just scattered. I mean, some of them are pins, some of them are balls, some of them are you know, various random shapes, and they're just all over this thing. And some of them are natural uranium, and some of them are low enriched uranium, and some of them are highly enriched uranium. And I started walking toward the shelves, and my guide said, eh, I wouldn't do that. I said, why not? He said, it's, we've put enough on there that it's you know, fairly close to criticality. There are a lot of neutrons by those, by those shelves. I was like, okay, I'm standing back here. Um, anyway, there's a lot of security measures you can and should take. 
my basic view is that what, what would the victory in this four-year effort to secure nuclear material look like? I think if we can get to the point where all countries that have some highly enriched uranium or some plutonium or an actual nuclear weapon at least protect it against sort of a baseline level of threat, say a modest group of well-armed and well-trained outsiders, at least one insider well-placed and maybe the outsiders and an insider working together, number one. Number two, then for the countries that face higher threats, like Pakistan is an obvious example that they're protected against even more than that baseline level of threat. And if we can get all of the most vulnerable places around the world cleaned out completely so that there just isn't any nuclear material there anymore, which is the only way you can absolutely guarantee that nuclear material will never be stolen from a building is make sure there's nothing there to steal. Um, that to me would be victory in this uh, four-year campaign. We probably won't get all of that done in four years, but I think we can get a lot of it done in Thank four you. years. Thank you. Sorry for such long answers to these questions, but I, sometimes I like to tell a few war stories to give people the feeling. This is perhaps a bit of a follow-up, but you've spoken about foreign countries, foreign terrorists, but not so much about homegrown threats and dirty bombs. And right. as I ask this question, I'm thinking about a conversation I had earlier about the man in Belfast, Maine, who was found with quite a bit of, of plutonium, a surprising amount to authorities, and was planning on, on building or had plans for a dirty bomb. I think it was plutonium. I okay. think it was another radioactive okay. material. I yeah. am incorrect about that. But right. still, that, that threat of U.S. Right. citizens, people here, right. who can use various tactics to get material to build not so much the right. bombs that you're talking about, but a dirty bomb that can still right. do some serious damage. Right. So uh, first of all, let me explain sort of different kinds of nasty things terrorists right. might do with either nuclear or radiological material. At the extreme end of the spectrum is terrorists actually setting off a nuclear bomb. Either a stolen nuclear bomb that they managed to figure out how to detonate, which by the way is not so easy. Most nuclear weapons are equipped with some kind of electronic lock to prevent unauthorized use, or if not an electronic lock, what's called an environmental sensing device that basically says the weapon doesn't arm unless it's gone through the normal target sequence, like if it's a ballistic missile warhead until it's been on a rocket for a couple of minutes and then coasted through space for a while and so on. So it's, even if you have a stolen nuclear weapon, it's not necessarily so clear you're going to be able to figure out how to set it off. Or uh, a crude nuclear bomb that they might make themselves with nuclear material, which unfortunately is not as hard as many people uh, think, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, the sort of, and that would be extremely catastrophic, quite difficult to do. The sort of medium kind of nuclear terrorism, both in terms of degree of catastrophicness and degree of difficulty, would be uh, a, a really successful sabotage of a nuclear power plant. Most kinds of sabotage of a nuclear power plant won't make any difference, except it might cost a lot of money to the guy who owns the nuclear power plant. Um, but there are scenarios where you could cause a major radioactive release, and that would be a huge problem. Uh, but that's fairly difficult to do, because the plants are built to be fairly safe. Uh, and at least in this country, they have armed guards. Many other countries, believe it or not, uh, have rules against having any armed guards at all at nuclear power plants. And there are some countries that have no armed guards at all at sites that have quite a bit of highly enriched uranium uh, or plutonium. You'll notice I'm not mentioning which countries uh, in particular or which particular sites. I never say, you know, oh, you know, facility X has this giant gaping hole in the fence until after, you know, said vulnerability has been fixed. Um, <clears throat> for reasons that are probably obvious. Uh, so then you have the dirty bomb. Uh, so what a dirty bomb is, is just taking some radioactive material and dispersing it. You could use explosives to disperse it or there are a variety of other things you might do uh, to disperse it. And that exactly as you say, uh, could be done right here. Um, pretty much every hospital, for example, has a, you know, a big radioactive source that's uh, really radioactive and if you dispersed it, it would make a really nasty and expensive mess. Probably no one would actually die of radiation poisoning, uh, but you'd create panic, you'd have to evacuate a substantial area, the economic disruption is potentially big, the cleanup costs are potentially big. If the area that's contaminated is, you know, midtown Manhattan, you know, the economic disruption costs are potentially, you know, really big. I mean, we're potentially talking about tens or conceivably even $100 billion uh, dollars in sort of disruption, cleanup costs, et cetera. Um, uh, and that's uh, unfortunately relatively easy for terrorists to do. On the other hand, there's a lot of things that are pretty easy for terrorists to do that they haven't done. 
uh, you know, it would be quite easy for terrorists to walk into a shopping mall and start shooting people, and then five days after that, walk into a different shopping mall somewhere else in the country and start shooting people, and five days after that, do it somewhere else in the country, and pretty soon nobody would be going to shopping malls anymore, and our economy would be hit, you know, in a significant way. Um, so it, it is a little bit of a mystery why some of these fairly simple things um, haven't happened. Uh, my colleague Rolf Moet Larsen, who tends to take a dark view of things, he was the person in charge of tracking down Al-Qaeda's nuclear, chemical, and biological efforts for the CIA after 9-11. And his view is the reason some of these simple things haven't happened is because they really want to do something bigger than 9-11 for their next shot inside the United States. Um, and that they haven't yet, you know, gotten to the point where they've got something that they think is big enough to not seem like it come down from the 9-11 uh, attacks. Um, because, you know, what they want to do is take us down. And they understand now that it takes some pretty big blows to take us down. I don't think they're ever going to be able to take us down, but that's what they want to do. I think we're a strong and resilient country, and they're, you know, at this point a ragtag band of, of extremists. Um, but they're going to be a ragtag band of extremists that's being annoying for a really long time. Uh, so the, the radiological stuff, one piece of good news there is there is a substantial effort uh, to secure that stuff better, at least the biggest, most dangerous sources uh, as well. And in fact, right here at Harvard, there were recently some significant upgrades paid for by the Department of Energy and some exercises to you know, make sure that the, the Harvard police and the Cambridge police were sort of working together if, if something happened and so on. And there have been similar upgrades uh, done for the research reactor down uh, the street at MIT. Uh, they have really uh, substantially uh, upgraded security systems uh, there now. Um, so, you know, things are getting a little bit better. But there's a, a pretty easy program if we would just allocate the money uh, that they're investing about 250000 for each hospital basically, and we could just take radiological material from hospitals basically off the table for bad guys for, you know, a pretty modest investment, and I, I think that would be worth doing. Um, uh, but it's, it's not happening at the moment, at the pace it needs to at the moment, and in fact, one thing I, I've been remiss in not mentioning is the current budget situation, which is something I would encourage you all to write your Congress people about. Uh, so the Republicans, as you probably know, are attempting to cut uh, a lot of money out of the federal budget for the current fiscal year in the debate over what's called a continuing resolution, which is basically Congress didn't get around to doing any of its work last year in terms of passing any appropriations bills. So they just have what's called a continuing resolution that says, well, spend about the same amount as you spent back in fiscal year 2010. Um, but the Republicans want to have it say spend less than you spent uh, back then. Um, and in particular, they want to cut $600 million from the programs that are for about securing nuclear material and securing radiological material and so on. And, you know, the really high priority stuff, like getting the highly enriched uranium out of Ukraine, that's going to get paid for, you know, one way or another. But what that means is that the stuff that's considered a little bit lesser priority, like the radiological stuff, isn't going to get done if that money uh, gets cut. Uh, so uh, I think that's a, a, a really foolish uh, move. In a situation where these efforts really have been bipartisan for a long time, there are, there are both there are heroes who have you know really supported these efforts on both sides of the aisle uh, over uh, many years, um, and I've been privileged to work with a lot of Republican colleagues over the years uh, on these kinds of uh, programs. I currently co-teach with a uh, Republican colleague uh, the nonproliferation course at uh, at the Kennedy School right now. We were just. Uh, just having our, uh, teaching our students about what's going on with Iran right now uh, this morning, because our students are just moving into a simulation of negotiating over Iran's uh, nuclear program, which they'll be doing for the next week. We'll see what they manage to come up with. Thank you. All right, thank you. Again, I apologize for such long answers. I think you've already answered the question I was gonna ask, which was dirty bombs. And I just wanna hear a little bit more. My thoughts were more along the lines of the anthrax scare mm -hmm. and how quickly even though it was just white powder, we got extremely nervous about stuff where we couldn't tell really whether it was anthrax or not. And I guess I want your assurance that uh, somehow dirty bombs, the sort of radiation which you might get from a hospital or something like that, is always detectable. Will we always be sure that, that there was not a dirty bomb going on? 
being prepared for. My question really is because I see that so ideas travel very fast, as we see in the Middle East right now. Fear, the unthinkable, suddenly becomes possible. Right, right. Well, that's a great question. And in fact, uh, you know, the anthrax, the effects of the anthrax attacks linger to this day, really, in the sense that I don't know how many of you have attempted to mail something to somebody in the Senate, but you may as well just forget about it because it all, you know, if you wanted to get there in a hurry anyway, you have to get somebody to actually walk it in or something or send it to some place where they go outside the building because everything goes off to some facility out in Maryland someplace and gets, you know, irradiated and blah, 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 blah to, you know, so that if it had anthrax in it, it would all be dead by the time it got to anybody in the Senate. But it also means that the Senate doesn't get its mail for three weeks after it arrives. You know? um, anyway, be that as it may. Um, most radiation is easily detectable with pretty simple detectors. Um, so the, the radiological material that terrorists are probably most likely to use is stuff like cobalt-60, cesium-137, iridium-192, these are things that, you know, they emit gamma rays that are really easy to detect, basically. The, um, the somewhat, if the, if the terrorists, and I think the terrorists would probably use stuff that was easy to detect because they want us to know in order to create the panic. If nobody knows it's happening, then there's no panic, right? Uh, but there are things that aren't so easy that the normal detectors don't detect. So things that emit alpha particles uh, the normal detectors don't really detect. Now, alpha particles don't hurt you either unless you breathe in the thing that is emitting the alpha particle or you eat the thing that's emitting the alpha particle. If I'm holding, for example, plutonium in my hand, um, it's going to emit some alpha particles. It'll emit some neutrons and some gamma rays. The neutrons and gamma rays will be going in and destroying cells in my hand and so on. But the alpha particles will be stopped by the layer of dead skin cells before they even get to the layer of live skin cells. Um, but by the same token, if they're in your lung, they deposit sort of all their energy in the cell right next to them, and so the, the odds of getting some DNA damage that might lead to cancer are quite high. So if you have a, a very tiny p uh, particle of plutonium lodged deep in your lungs, um, your chance of getting lung cancer is distressingly high. Um, so alpha particle things would be a worry in terms of detectability by most of the usual detectors. That was one of the reasons why they didn't realize Litvinenko uh, had radiation poisoning for a while because he was totally radioactive, but it was alpha particles and they were using a Geiger counter that detects gamma and they were like, he's not radioactive. Uh, uh, so it took a little while to figure out that in fact he was suffering from uh, radiation poisoning. Um, uh, I do think that a key element of dirty bomb defense is public education and um, getting people to understand better what is and is not dangerous about radiation because currently the very word radiation makes people so terrified. Um, I mean, there was a great example in the New York Times just over the weekend. They had this huge story about um, the uh, toxics that come up with the well water when you do this fracturing rock for uh, natural gas. And there's a lot of nasty, toxic stuff that comes up in that water. But what they focused on was the radioactivity. I was like, man, if, if the only thing in that stuff was the radioactivity, I, that would be great, because that's way less toxic than all the other stuff that's in there <laughs> that you're not talking about. And then they had a comparison to, to coal. And they said, well, coal puts it, you know, Burning coal emits a lot of radioactivity. I was like, well, that's, that's a fact. That's true. But it's the fine particulates that kill tens of thousands of people every year from coal. You know, why don't you talk about that? So people are confused about how dangerous radioactivity is compared to other dangers that we face in our lives all the time. OK. Um, so I don't know much about physics, but this is a question that's kind of been on my mind for a while. I was wondering if you thought, think it's plausible that within the next 100 years or so that science and technology might advance to a point where it becomes easy to construct some sort of a nuclear bomb or any sort of fission or fusion device? Uh, I think not. Um, uh, so um, I think the, the ways to put nuclear material together in order to make a nuclear bomb have been pretty thoroughly explored. Uh, and I don't think there's going to be anything particularly new under that sun. 
where there may be new things is in producing the nuclear bomb material. Um, there's probably, the, on the plutonium end, you know, it takes, you gotta have a reactor to irradiate stuff so that it absorbs neutrons and becomes plutonium. Then you gotta do chemical processing to separate out the plutonium from all the other nasty, yucky, radioactive stuff that's created. I don't think that'll, you know, have any dramatic breakthrough that makes it totally easy. What I do worry about a little is on the uranium enrichment end. I mean, if somebody invented sort of a desktop way to enrich uranium, that would be a, a very bad thing. There is actually an interesting thing that's going on right now where we already have this technology, uranium enrichment centrifuges, which are now the dominant way of enriching uranium, which are pretty small and easy to hide. But now uh, General Electric and a consortium of a number of other countries, uh, uh, companies, excuse me, are building a new laser enrichment system that uses even less power and is even smaller and, and potentially easier to hide. And um, the American Physical Society, uh, which is the professional society for physicists, has petitioned the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to say, you ought to, whenever somebody has some new technology for uranium enrichment or plutonium reprocessing, you ought to include in the licensing process a non-proliferation assessment. They're not saying you shouldn't license anything new, they should just say you ought to at least think about what the non-proliferation implications are before you do. I think, and that's, by the way, open for public comment, that particular petition at the moment. If anybody feels like commenting, you can go to the APS website and get the link as to where you should submit your public comments. Um, I think it seems like a pretty reasonable idea to me that you ought to at least think about it before licensing new technologies of this kind. When Glenn Seaborg, who discovered plutonium, was chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, he actually canceled the original program on laser enrichment of uranium because he said, Lord, the last thing the United States did, needs to do is develop an easy to hide way to enrich uranium. <laughs> but uh, that wisdom didn't last, unfortunately. Uh, hi. Uh, the terrorist intent is actually, uh, because they are a relatively minor force, uh, have the potential of creating an instigation of either regional or, or potentially uh, global conflict. So if there was the use of a dirty bomb uh, uh, as opposed to uh, airplanes flying into the World Trade Center, uh, then that could actually be a precursor towards a, a larger event than simply a policing action in Afghanistan and, and uh, Iraq. So, so then there are, there are rogue potential states, says North Korea or, or, okay, or Iran, who are ostensibly creating fission bombs. Then there are fusion bombs which are much larger because they're in the megatons rather than the kilotons. So, but a dirty bomb is not even a bomb. So the question is, uh, in terms of a hierarchy, ultimately, if the, if the fusion bombs are used, then that's it. But fusion bombs are sort of less so because that's just Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So my question is, well, what it exactly is Iran producing and, and Pakistan relative to what we already have? And then how would the terrorists instigate? Right. So there's, there's a number of questions wrapped together here. Uh, uh, it's an interesting question. So first of all, let me explain. Um, fusion weapons, uh, as you correctly say, are significantly larger than fission weapons. It's certainly... Uh, one thing that many people believe that isn't really correct is that there's enough nuclear weapons in the world to kill everybody on Earth. Not so. There'd be lots of people who weren't living in major cities or downwind of major cities who would, who would live through. They wouldn't necessarily be very happy because a lot of the major cities would be destroyed and so on. Uh, but it would not be the, the end of the species or the end of all the other species or anything like that. It would certainly be a very catastrophic event if all the nuclear weapons were used. Um, but in particular, if a Hiroshima-sized bomb were dropped, for example, on the state capitol building in Boston, 
I don't think our windows would even be broken here. And if the wind was not blowing in the right direction, you know, we'd, we'd be panicked, but we'd be fine physically. Um, uh, so nuclear weapons are very powerful, but you shouldn't exaggerate how powerful they are. Um, uh, um, and even fusion weapons, you know, you can take out a very significant part of a city like New York, but there'd be, you know, if you dropped a one megaton bomb right on the middle of New York, you know, parts of the outer boroughs would still be okay. <laughs> Uh, now that's, I don't want to minimize things, but we, we need to understand scale. You know, it's not like one bomb wipes out the whole country or the whole state or anything like that. Um, now, I think the most interesting part of your question has to do with terrorists trying to use their attacks to catalyze a larger conflict of some kind. And in particular, just recently, um, there was a large meeting of the, the renamed group that was used to be called lashkar e uh, Army of the Pure uh, in Pakistan, which were the ones who committed the Mumbai uh, horrific attack a little while ago. And uh, Hafez Saeed, the founder of that group, gave a big speech in which he said, you know, we really have to take on uh, India and if it requires uh, nuclear jihad uh, to get India out of Kashmir, then, you know, so be it. Uh, quote, no problem, unquote, he, as he put it, even if India strikes back with nuclear weapons. Uh, it, this is a translated quote from the ur original Urdu, of course. Uh, uh, so I think there is a real danger that terrorists might attempt, particularly in that conflict between India and Pakistan, to carry out actions that they hoped would catalyze some larger conflict. And in fact, you know, the Mumbai almost succeeded in catalyzing a larger conflict. The, on the Indian side, their perspective is that Pakistan is hiding behind its nuclear weapons in order to have the freedom to launch terror attacks in India at will, and that ultimately India has to do something about this. So for a while, India was talking about a doctrine that they called Cold Start, which was the notion that you know, from a moment's notice they would, be, they would have the capability to invade Pakistan and strike whatever terrorist camp it was that they wanted to get at quickly before you know, Pakistan could threaten its nuclear weapons and get the United States to tell everybody to calm down and so on, uh, so that they would sort of get their, the, second, the retaliatory punch in before everybody stopped the fight, basically. Um, it's, I don't think that strategy was ever realistic and they sort of backed off from it, but I, there is a, I think, if there is another Mumbai-like attack, there will be major pressure in India to say, okay, we can't just sit back and not retaliate again as we have the last several times. You know, the parliament attack, the, there was an attack on a train that killed uh, 47 people. Um, uh, I think there will be significant political pressure to strike. And if, they, if Indian forces go very far into Pakistan, there'll be significant pressure in Pakistan to think about nuclear use. And I think that the while both sides want to avoid nuclear war, I think they don't really understand each other's red lines very well. And there's a real potential for one side crossing a red line without really realizing that's what they're doing. I mean, if you look at the Cuban Missile Crisis, neither the United States nor the Soviet Union had any interest in going to nuclear war. But in retrospect, the leaders on both sides really felt, boy, we came awfully close. So that there's a fog of crisis as well as a fog of war that can that can create real dangers when you have nuclear armed adversaries going at each other. Uh, so. But those are all fission stockpiles, aren't they? At the moment, the uh, India and Pakistan are fission stockpiles, correct? We'll take one more question, please. Could you take two? Two, okay. My question begins with the confession. I'm the person who tacked that, the suitcase bombs onto the rogue states. Mm -hmm. And I did that, um, so that you could lift a fog of ignorance, I guess, and so that you could be upbeat and optimistic about something, and it worked. Um, <laughs> but um, I think there is ignorance about the idea, the, the image of the suitcase bomb, which may, may be better described as a dirty bomb, is out there, and you talked about the social consequences of, of any kind of a nuclear incident as panic, and I think that that image is one that 
causes people to panic and puts people's nerves on edge. But that's not really what I want to ask you about. What I want to ask you about is intelligence. You listed a number of incidents of really dismal intelligence failures and 20 years of ignorance. And then you said that there were some, some successes. And I wonder what makes for success? Do you see those conditions getting stronger? And do you see any difference in the kind of intelligence that's needed for terrorists abroad or incidents at home? Wow, really meaty, important questions. I'm not sure how, how well I can uh, deal with them. My strong impression is that the cases where we've had our biggest intelligence successes have mostly involved human intelligence, that is having good spies in the right places. Uh, so, for example, very recently, we, uh, although uh, small uranium enrichment facilities using centrifuges can be very difficult to find, Iran started building one secretly uh, at a place called Fordow near the holy city of Qom. Uh, and uh, the United States and several other countries uh, working together found out about it long bef years before any centrifuges were installed. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I think that created some deterrent effect in Iran because it essentially sent them a message, you know, we're, we're inside your system. We, we know what you're doing. Um, and so that, I think, creates some deterrent about, you know, building another secret facility because we might find out about that uh, as well. And I think the Stuxnet computer virus that infected the Iranian enrichment facility, I think, probably also... Uh, created some of that feeling because that facility, that, those computers aren't hooked to the internet. That had to actually be, you know, inserted in a USB drive or something like that into that uh, facility by somebody who might not have been a knowing person. It might have been someone who, you know, normally inserted things and had, was working at another computer that was infected and, it, and brought it in or what have you, uh, what's sometimes called sneaker net. Um, uh, but I think human intelligence is very important and very difficult, and it requires a certain level of sort of risk-taking that uh, is often difficult. And I think, actually, that the problem of terrorism intelligence is actually especially hard. You know, these terrorist groups are very difficult to penetrate. Um, you know, and there's a reason why we haven't found bin Laden and Zawahiri. They're just really, really hard to find, and the people who know where they are don't talk. Um, uh, now, in terms of finding the people inside the United States, um, it appears we've been doing a fairly good job of that uh, over the course of the last 10 years or so. There's quite a number of, of you know, plots that have been disrupted. Um, but I think we should never, we shouldn't believe that anti-terrorism efforts have to always be perfect or they've failed. Right? I mean, you know, anti-terrorism efforts like any human endeavor are imperfect. Every once in a while, some plot is gonna get through and something is, you know, something is gonna happen. And we shouldn't think that, you know, a president is a bad president or is not doing, has a terrible anti-terrorism policy because uh, something happened. Something could have happened on George W. Bush's watch after 9-11, it didn't. Um, something may happen on President Obama's watch and uh, it may not. Um, uh, but it, there's a lot of work to be done on intelligence. My several colleagues of mine and I have a particular proposal that we're pushing now for a sort of specialized team that would have people who knew a lot about the terrorist networks, knew a lot about these nuclear smuggling networks, and knew the sort of physics and science of what they should be looking for in terms of what a terrorist nuclear bomb program would look like to go out there in a proactive way, recruit sources, and try to get information about what's going on in some of these nuclear smuggling cases. I mean, the, the most recent nuclear smuggling case that was an important one anyway was uh, as recently as uh, March of 2010, there was highly enriched uranium seized in Georgia. Uh, and it may well be that it was the same highly enriched uranium seized in Georgia in 2003. I, I can tell that story a little bit more if we have time. But anyway, let me get to this last question. I, I read that Mubarak uh, was developing a nuclear weapons program, and he, um, and in addition, he violated 
a number of UN requirements? Um, you, I think you've got your countries just a little bit switched. I think you're thinking of Gaddafi. Um, so uh, could, no, um, I well, uh, Egypt. Egypt, Egypt had a, I mean, a sort of s very small, not very important, I would argue, nuclear weapons program many, many years ago. And then they had, uh, and they abandoned it. And then they had, um, a few years ago, they had some small activities at some of their uh, nuclear facilities that um, were in violation of IEA safeguards. Um, and uh, some of which haven't been fully resolved, but. Basically, there's not a, a serious uh, nuclear program uh, in Egypt. Uh, in Libya, by contrast, they had um, a program where they didn't have much indigenous capability, but they were going to get a turnkey uranium enrichment facility from the AQ Khan uh, network. Uh, and then, um, in order to get out from under the Western sanctions, they were negotiating over accepting responsibility for the Lockerbie bombing. And they realized that in order to get out of the unilateral US sanctions, they would also have to deal with the weapons of mass destruction. They negotiated secretly with the United States and Britain over a period of months. <clears throat> and then in 2003, Gaddafi agreed to uh, eliminate all his, his weapons of mass destruction programs. All the centrifuges were airlifted to the United States. They're sitting in, most of them are sitting in Oak Ridge, uh, Tennessee at the moment. Um, uh, um, and uh, in addition, as I mentioned earlier, there was a bunch of highly enriched uranium at Tajura that has now been airlifted out of the country as well. I have a, a colleague who works in the Department of Energy who, when she was seven months pregnant with her first child, against the or direct orders of her boss and her boss's boss, flew to Kazakhstan uh, to finish a deal relating to getting rid of some highly enriched uranium there. And then when that child was seven months old, spent both Thanksgiving and Christmas in Libya getting rid of the highland rich uranium in Libya. So we are fortunate to have uh, public servants as dedicated uh, as she is uh, dealing with some of these uh, dangers around the world. Well, we have five more minutes and I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative for one last question. You've never mentioned nuclear repository or spent nuclear fuel or the fact that a third... Nuclear fuel as a source of plutonium, but anyway. And that a third of... U.S. reactors have their storage above ground and that mm -hmm. all of the radioactive fuel is sitting at the sites because we don't have a national repository. Now, uh, those places are vulnerable. We have no money to put, put the stuff in casks. Uh, this seems to me quite a dramatic danger. Um, yes and no. Um, so uh, these are at nuclear power plant sites. The nuclear power plant sites are uh, defended uh, under Nuclear Regulatory Commission regulations. I would argue, you know, they maybe need better security than they're required to have at the moment, but they have more security than anything else in our civilian infrastructure in the United States has, for sure, including for the uh, spent fuel pools and the, the dry casks outside at those plants where the spent fuel pools are full. Now the spent fuel pools certainly are an additional target for sabotage. And in particular, that those of the pools that are very overstuffed, where the, the spent fuel elements are very close together, and where there's some of the spent fuel that has been discharged very recently, so it's still very hot. In those particular pools, if terrorists managed to sabotage the, wall, the pool such that they you know, blew a big hole in the wall of the pool or something and the water drained out, then the fuel could potentially get hot enough to so that the zirconium cladding on the fuel would catch fire. And that, that fire then would mobilize a lot of radioactivity up into the air. And if the terrorists had also managed to destroy the sort of building that the spent fuel pool is in, such that that smoke then went into the surrounding countryside, you could have a pretty substantial radioactive uh, release. So I regard that as part of the overall issue of sabotage that I talked about. You could sabotage the reactor or you could sabotage the spent fuel pool. The, the dry casks that are at each of the sites I think are a relatively modest security concern. They're, they're big steel or concrete casks. The spent fuel in them has been cooled for a long time. It's not gonna catch fire. If you hit them with say a rocket propelled grenade, 
you might very well be able to get some new radioactive material to spill and make a nasty mess that the, would be annoying for the company that owned the pad where that nasty mess was that would have to clean it up, but it, it wouldn't kill anybody off site. Um, <clears throat> now, I do believe that we should have been moving forward toward a repository. I think it was a mistake uh, when President Obama canceled the Yucca Mountain repository. I find it particularly disappointing because he can't, came to office promising not to let politics overrule science, and one of his first big decisions in my area was precisely to let politics overrule science. A total of one reason why Yucca Mountain was canceled, and that is that the majority leader of the United States Senate happens to be from Nevada. Um, <clears throat> um, I am hopeful that the Blue Ribbon Commission that President Obama appointed, uh, which is beavering away at the moment, I was just talking to uh, one of the members and one of the staff people, uh, will come up with some sensible approaches for a more democratic and more voluntary way uh, to move forward with choosing a site for disposal of nuclear waste. In Finland and in Sweden, they have chosen sites, and they have chosen sites with the support of the local communities. In fact, in Finland, the community that didn't get it sued, um, <laughs> and uh, which led me to the obvious thought, well, gee, I wonder if they'd want ours. <laughs> um, but I, I don't think the answer to that is yes. But uh, uh. Thank you, Matthew Bunn. You have been listening to Cambridge Forum, co-sponsored by the First Parish Church in Cambridge, Unitarian Universalist, the Lowell Institute, and the Friends of Cambridge Forum. For more information about this program entitled Rogue States and Suitcase Bombs, Coping with a New Nuclear Threat, recorded in March 2011, featuring Matthew Bunn, or for more information about this program, visit us on the web at cambridgeforum.org. In Harvard Square, I'm Dr. David Rush. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>